Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Open to Export webinar, updating importers and exporters on what you need to know during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I am the Senior Content Editor at the Institute of Export and International Trade. Just a quick note to say that we are all dialing in from home as per social distancing rules. So if there is a lag at any points due to home Wi-Fi, please do bear with us. Next slide, please. Open to Export is a free online service helping small businesses get ready to sell overseas to our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, and our export action plan tool. You can find out about all of these on our website at www.opentexport.com. Next, please. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's professional membership body for traders, endorsed by the World Trade Organization and the International Chamber of Commerce as a small business champion. We offer a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. Next, please. The Institute has largely moved online, offering a range of online support and telephone assistance throughout the pandemic. This includes digital training courses and export masterclasses, international trade surgeries, which can be conducted over the phone, online qualifications provided by both the Institute and the UK Customs Academy, a technical helpline for exporters, daily bulletins bringing you all the key trade stories, and of course, the free articles and webinars on the Open to Export platform. With the government indicating that it's looking to press on with ending the transition period at the end of 2020, we do recommend you continue your Brexit preparations, especially as many of the Institute's relevant courses are still fully fundable by government grants. You can find out more information about our support on export.org.uk and please feel free to contact us if you have any queries. Next, please. We will be running a live Q&A later in the session and can ask questions at any point using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. The general principle we will adopt is that we'll only ask questions that are relevant to the broader audience so we won't be able to go into company specifics as such. If you do have specific questions, we can refer you to our technical helpline afterwards. We will also be avoiding any speculative or political questions, um, and you can download a PDF of the slides at any point via a handout dropdown on your control panel, and you will also be able to watch a recording of this webinar on opentextbook.com forward slash webinars within a day of it finishing. Now, before, on to the next slide. Before I hand over to today's speaker, we are going to be running a few straw polls during today's session. Starting with this question, what has been the main impact of COVID-19 on your business? Um, pick the one which most applies from delays at customs, cash flow issues, staff off sick, decline in demand for our services, and the rise in price of freight transport. While you are ask, answering that question, I'm delighted to welcome today's speaker, Kevin Shakespeare from the Institute of Export and International Trade, a regular speaker on our webinars indeed. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Will. Thank you very much. And um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to present today. Thank you. Um, so I could give everyone a few more seconds to answer, answer this question. It's the one which most applies to you. And if, if none of these apply to you, um, or you don't think this is question relevant to you, don't don't feel obliged to answer. So I will conclude the poll in three, two, one. And here are the results so far. So um decline in demand for our services tops the poll this week on 45%. The rise in freight transport and cash flow issues are up, up there as well. Um, interestingly, I think decline in demand for services has been the top answer each week we've asked this question. So that's a interesting, interesting finding there. But anyway, without any further ado, I shall hand over to Kevin on the next slide, please. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody, again. Um, this is uh, the second uh, COVID-19 webinar that uh, I presented, uh, with the first webinar being on the 26th of March. And uh, uh, I guess it honestly does not feel just over a month since the uh, 
the first uh, presentation and, and I hope everyone um, uh, listening in today is well and safe and thank you very much for joining and, and thank you for completing the poll as well. So um, in this webinar there, there will be some aspects uh, that, were covered at, uh, that were covered on the 26th of March. There'll be some updates but there's also been a couple of important announcements that we will refer to and important considerations for businesses um, and even as we go through some of these businesses when we refer to it might seem we're referring to trading goods but that also refers to some aspects of trading in services and also small parcels and e-commerce as well uh, could we have a next slide please so um, again the context is both domestic and international trade continue to uh, to be impacted by this deadly virus and it affects everything we do every way in which we carry out business move goods uh, present documents make customs declarations it's all affected um, and again we, we at the institute try try and keep obviously our members and and and, and, and all other um, uh, organizations and and uh, uh, people listening today from open to export updated through the likes of our, our our daily bulletin to our members so please look out for that because we're doing the best to interpret the various notices both from government from uh, from freight forwarders from shipping lines and from port operators to try and keep everyone up to date so today we'll we'll continue continue to look at impacts on trade and supply chains, but we'll also look at some government support measures uh, that are, uh, have been announced since the last webinar, uh, both in terms of customs, some import duty and VAT, and also support from UK export finance. We'll again consider the steps that businesses uh, uh, should consider taking. We'll look at future medium term view, and we do have a slide right at the end on some very important Brexit related announcements. Uh, and, and again, the underlying theme here is, is the need for businesses to train um, uh, their staff, to have contingency of staff available, and to professionalize every aspect uh, of, uh, of the trade and customs procedures that your business is undertaking. Uh, can we have in the next slide, please? So again, some headline output from COVID-19. Uh, some of the recent estimates suggest that shipping uh, will um, uh, will have a, around about a 20% reduction in, in shipping in world trade in uh, quarter one, that is, uh, of this year. Um, and it's fair to say that supply chains and freight movements are having to adapt, and, and we'll look at some examples of that shortly. Uh, as I've indicated, the government have made in, in important announcements, and both the government, um, customs officials, all types of businesses are having to work differently. And again, we'll look at some examples of, of how businesses and, and, and government are working differently at this time. It is fair to say that there are still relatively good freight volumes on the likes of fresh produce, foods, medical cleaning products, and other, other grocery supplies. The volumes are, are generally holding up there, um, as are an, uh, agricultural and, and animal feeds, uh, albeit uh, there are variations, uh, both, uh, both relating to regions and seasonal variations. There is totally understandable, and it links in with the outputs from the poll, a, de a declining uh, demand from uh, uh, non-essential businesses and non-essential products. And, and clearly, the closure of, of the ve vehicle manufacturing plants in the UK and Europe has seen a large decline, which, which really reflects, obviously, the lots of different parts of the, uh, of the automotive supply chain. If we could have a next slide, please. So looking at supply chain adaptation. Now, for some businesses, this is clearly a lot uh, a lot more feasible than others, depending on, 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 on what the nature of your business uh, has done. But there are some notable examples that we'll refer to here. There is the Ventilator Challenge UK, which is a, a consortium of UK industrial um, technology engineering businesses, which are working together to produce uh, medical ventilators uh, and obviously uh, receive approval, regulatory approval to release those ventilators. Um, as always, there are key outlets and key products with the focus on, uh, on uh, grocery and pharmaceutical sectors and distribution. So uh, you'll see on the left-hand side of the slide, are you involved in these supply chains or do you have products that could be involved in these supply chains? Um, do you have specialist skill sets, uh, 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 specialist products? 
uh, raw materials that can actually feed into these supply chains. And we've also seen in the context of consumer brands and manufacturers that there's been a, a a push for some large consumer brands, but also small mid-sized uh, consumer brands uh, to produce protective equipment, such as the, uh, uh, face visors, gowns, aprons, gloves, and masks. So clearly there has been a, a, a large amount of of supply chain adaptation. I was speaking to someone I knew locally uh, who, who, who works for a company that um, traditionally, and I, I, I better not name the company, who, 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 who provide um, uh, support for um, pesticides and, um, and um, also diseases, animal diseases, and, and they managed to change and flex their product accordingly uh, to provide um, hand sanitizers. So there are possible changes in, in, in manufacturing supply chains that can be done. Now, in the context, uh, th there's been a lot of talk around relaxation of product rules, but it is fair to say that formula um, formulation labeling requirements still apply. Uh, just because a product is, is, is labeled as PPE uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to pass all the regulatory tests. So quality assurance, quality control is still needed. And PPE must comply with requirements in the EU regulations, which are essential health and safety requirements. Now, traditionally, we've known that as, as the requirement to meet CE marking requirements. That's still the case. And while there is some relaxation, so, for example, um, visors can meet British standard and e EN European national standards now. That still requires uh, uh, approval from the UK cross-governmental uh, uh, committee in that respect. So, whilst there's some relaxation of rules, it still needs a uh, uh, approval because um, at the end of the day, the equipment needs to be of the correct standard, the quality assurance to actually have the impact that it should do. If we have a next slide, please. So um, supply chains must keep moving. Uh, this is absolutely essential. And again, it's interesting looking at the poll there that um, uh, customs procedures um, in, a, in a large amount of cases are still working and supply chains are moving. There clearly is an issue um, uh, around the warehousing space sometimes, which we'll refer to. And never has it been more important, as I've said before, that supplier and customer communications um, continue to take place, um, both now for uh, emergency sales, to making sure the buyer hopefully is, is, is ready to take possession of the goods, but also if, if and when, or as and when, Europe starts to reopen. And we'll, uh, we have the example of Germany below on this slide, where, where um, uh, Volkswagen reopened the, the, the world's biggest car factory at Wolfsburg uh, this Monday. And there's ge generally been a gradual reopening. Now, clearly at this stage, we don't know the impact of that reopening. Uh, in terms of the virus. But um, if, as and when reopening takes place uh, uh, across Europe, businesses, customers, suppliers must communicate, must be ready to do business and to work together for the greater good. Now, in terms of, uh, of freight movements and, and supply chains, the government announced last Friday that it struck a deal with, uh, with the Republic of Ireland, France and other European countries to keep vital freight routes open, um, obviously for goods, food and medical supplies especially. Uh, and there was a freight and passenger support package uh, uh, put in place covering the vital trade routes. Uh, which included Eurotunnel. So uh, just by way of summary, there were seven routes covered between Great Britain and, uh, and Northern Ireland. There was routes to the Isle of Wight, the Penzance to uh, uh, the Isles of Scilly ferry, and 26 routes across a range of countries in Europe. Uh, so clearly, um, th there's a clear, a, a clear need in the, in the current environment to keep these trade routes and these supply these vital supply chains uh, are operating. If we can have a next slide, please. So uh, let's look some specific impacts now in terms of freight. 
So we're going to look at ocean freight and air freight on slide eight. Uh, but let's look on, on the part in yellow on this slide on the right hand side. So stills are, uh, goods are still getting through, but in sometimes with delays, freight prices are fluctuating. Uh, and, and we'll certainly talk about that in the next couple of slides. Some forwarders and shipping lines are have agreed to provide warehouse capacity. It is fair to say that tends to be uh, at, at a large transshipment ports and hubs globally, which would include uh, uh, some of the hubs in Europe as well. Um, and that's very, very important because in certainly in, in the early days of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, there was instances of goods not being able to be delivered, uh, goods having to be returned and, and who was going to pay for that. So certainly some of the large uh, uh, shipping lines uh, and, and forwarders have agreed to provide support there for undelivered goods. But clearly there are prior, priority routes and priority goods. Uh, we've talked about the priority goods, but um, the priority route certainly being the, the main transshipment hubs, the likes of Rotterdam, Antwerp, for example, Hamburg, uh, Felixstowe, uh, where um, th th there is a need to keep the, uh, the goods moving. And rail freight is popular, which really takes us to the uh, the left hand slides. Um, so um, statistics, as noted here from the China Railway Group, indicate the first quarter of 2020, and this was even during the uh, during the COVID-19 difficulties. There, there were 1,941 China to Europe freight trains, uh, which was growth of 15% year on year, even with uh, the impact of COVID-19. Now, even prior to COVID-19, rail freight from China was becoming more popular, but it's increasingly becoming popular um, uh, also during in, in COVID-19 uh, in terms of it being quicker than sea. Uh, and you can see on, on the slides there some of the transit times. Uh, from different Chinese cities to arrive in uh, Duisburg. Uh, but you can also see here uh, further transit times on the bottom right hand side in terms of China to Warsaw in Poland, to Hamburg, uh, to, to the UK, to, to Bark in, uh, in the UK, uh, near London uh, and to Moscow. So again, uh, big routes, big rail freight uh, moves from China and, 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 and that's been ongoing. But certainly during COVID-19, uh, the rail freight network has been never, never more important in terms of trying to uh, get goods and supplies through. If we have a next slide, please. So we turn to ocean freight. There's an element of sort of mixed picture here in terms of freight rates. And as we're going to look at later, uh, the price of oil has, has, has clearly um, dropped dramatically. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that on the slide later. So certainly the long term container um, uh, shipping rates have tended to fluctuate. Uh, so there was an increase in April, but a decrease in May. Uh, but overall, um, as we can see in the in the left hand corner in in column three, um, there has been a, a slight increase in the past week. Uh, uh, so movements again from, uh, for example, Shanghai to Rotterdam, 11% uh, increase, albeit down year on year. Uh, and uh, an and increase in rates from uh, Rotterdam to New York. Um, and But one of the big elements that, that has taken place is capacity withdrawal or capacity be withdrawn from the market. So we can see on the right hand side of this slide uh, uh, an excerpt from uh, Drury, uh, which is really showing the, uh, the number of, uh, of uh, blank sailings compared with the uh, scheduled sailings. So quite high there. So it indicates a need for businesses to communicate with the freight forwarders, with the shipping lines, uh, to try and make sure that, um, that, that their goods will get through uh, and hopefully not be impacted by blank sailings, or if they are, to look at alternatives um, in terms of uh, getting freight moving. So blank sailings is a feature, clearly. So again, communication with stakeholders becomes key. What we've also seen, uh, uh, a bit as well, which is, is is more the vessel operating companies, the actual carriers, is is that when the um, on the backhaul uh, voyages from Far East to Europe, that they're trying to uh, avoid uh, the Suez Canal because the very high tolls on the Suez Canal. So that's taking longer uh, for those backhaul voyages. So again, that's something clearly to to actually bear in mind and liaise with the forwarder to actually check if there's a potential impact on your business. 
If we have the next slide, please. So in terms of air freight impacts, now clearly the, the, the impact on air freight rates has been far more dramatic than, than ocean freight, and they keep rising. So um, clearly there's been a huge capacity drop. So normally in, in normal times, over half of the world's air cargo would travel uh, in uh, by the large passenger jets. But clearly in the passenger side, there's been widespread cancellations. So that's resulted in a huge drop in, in capacity. In some instances, the passenger jets have become almost freight only, but still there's been a huge drop in capacity. And also at the same time, there's a huge demand for time sensitive goods to actually uh, try and cope with uh, with the virus, which has kept air prices high. Uh, but there still is logistics demand uh, in the US and Europe. But if we look on the right hand side of the slide from the uh, from the TAC index, um, the the average air cargo rates, for example, from Shanghai to North America, um, literally in one week, 9.1% higher. So up to a record since the index started in March 2016 to now $9.34 per kilogram. And if we compare that with the start of March, in it, which was even to some extent impacted by COVID, um, the rate stood at 3.01, whereas maybe a year ago or in more normal times, it might have been slightly up from $1.5 per kilogram. So huge impacts there in terms of the increase in, in, in freight rates, which again reflects uh, some of your uh, feedback from the poll. And thank you for that again. So week on week, Shanghai to Europe, um, uh, an increase of 1.6%. And again, a record uh, uh, index high of 8.93 kilograms and a huge increase again from uh, uh, from March of 2.32. And then if we look from uh, from Hong Kong, which is uh, probably the uh, the largest freight airport in the world, um, a huge increase is again of 26.8 percent week on week. Uh, and um, so and 13.9 percent to to Europe. So we can see records in terms of the index and record costs in, in the context of air freight. So obviously a, a difficult picture from an air freight perspective, uh, which is get, which subject to feasibility, uh, some movements are, are clearly moving to, uh, to rail, uh, notwithstanding that they're, uh, they're nowhere near as quick as, uh, as air. So we move to the next slide, please. So after this slide, we're, we're, we're going to have another uh, poll. Um, this is quite a detailed slide, but what I thought I'd do here is just take some message from UK ports. So I just went on the sites of some of the largest UK ports. There are clearly other ports on here. Uh, so I started with Felix Doe. So really to try and get the message that these ports are still operational and open for business. Um, and and the recognition that all ports, Dover clearly is talked about very heavily in, in the context of, of Europe. Um, uh, Peel ports, Liverpool is, is essential. Uh, the other ports are as well in the context of Ireland and the United States to some extent, uh, as is Southampton uh, and London Gateway. And, and there's uh, loads of other ports I've not mentioned here, including uh, Tilbury, Grangemouth, Teesport, which uh, could have also been mentioned here. So clearly, the message is open for business at the ports. Clearly, uh, there's a need to try and move the uh, uh, staff um, to home working, documentation online. Um, and um, as we move through these slides, I'm going to comment more on that. So if I uh, pass over to Will for the poll, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. So the second poll is, are you still able to dispatch and receive component parts and goods? So it's been interesting to see kind of how everyone's supply chains have been affected so far. Um, Kevin, just while I let people answer that question, we had a question in advance sent through from Phil, um, who's kind of asking about the situation at ports, air and sea during lockdown. Um, he asked me, presumably there's delays because of COVID, do exporters need to kind of factor in extra time um, and potentially cost if as required or necessary. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a very good question, and and it and to some extent it could depend on on the nature of the goods and and the port you're using. It is would be good practice to obviously liaise with your freight forwarder to 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 make sure you're posing that question to them uh, so that they can liaise uh, and and look at the situation as well. But uh, I think the the the, uh, the best advice is yes, do look at the situation. 
do make sure um, uh, that um, you're looking um, at the situation in advance, that you have all your, all your documentation together, your customs declarations, because clearly it's now never important and never more important to make sure that you have everything correct in what you're doing. But definitely worth factoring in some contingency there, but liaising uh, with your stakeholders like your freight forwarders, but also liaising internally within your business to make sure you have uh, everything ready to go. Great, thank you. Thank you, Gavin. I hope that's answered your question, Phil. Um, so I'm just going to show the results of this poll today, which are really interesting. So 60% are still able to get it through, but with delays, 39% yes, but only 1% saying no, which is um, pretty encouraging, I think, really. So um, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Kevin, if you want to have any comments on that, but that's a really interesting poll. And thank you, everyone, for answering. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, and and it's really interesting in 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 the context of uh, the low level of of no there. And and um, certainly, I think it's reflective of a poll we had on the 26th of March, where there was a higher number of yes, goods are getting through with with delays, but there's even still a higher number still. So so I, I guess it's good news, but there's delays, and and again, it's important to liaise with your counterparties to make them them aware that there's delays as well. So we're all working together. And and probably as I've said before, by by working with counterparties, suppliers, customers, hopefully good relationships are really being formed here. If they didn't exist already, which they might have done, uh, and this concept of we're all in it together will bode very well for the future. Thank you. Next slide, please. So um, the export of PPE equipment. So there's been a couple of um, uh, EU uh, implementing regulations, uh, one on the 15th of March and uh, another one literally in the last few days, which to some extent is extending the, uh, uh, the license requirements around the export of PPE equipment. There are some changes as well. And you'll, you'll have um, uh, links here uh, of these new implementing regulations. So they basically say that anyone uh, wishing to export PPE to areas outside the EU, EFTA and, 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 and certain other related territories, uh, temporarily require a PPE export license. So, and, and the authorities, um, uh, in, uh, in in this case, the UK Department of uh, Health and Social Care, Care will consider whether the export threatens PPE supplies in the UK and the EU as well, not just the UK. It satisf satisfies a legitimate need for official medical use in the destination country and is needed to fulfill one or more purposes set out in the regulation. So effectively to support EU, World, Ho World Health Organization or other uh, international development organizations activities. So that criteria has to be met. So if you are making an application and want to export, but, uh, very much bear the need for that and full transparency as to where the goods are going and the benefit that it's providing. So any businesses who who are considering exporting PPE should look at at the at the government guidelines, uh, and and examples of of equipment are covered uh, here again: face shields, gloves, garments, visors, uh, mouth, nose protection equipment. Uh, we're going to look later at some of the commodity codes that are actually being used to to uh, to affect this. So similar, an extension of the, uh, the license requirements around PPE equipment, but I would stress heavily linked to the commodity codes, which we'll talk about. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, the, there have been a, a number of announcements um, uh, to try and, uh, I use the word easements, that might or not always be the best term to use. Uh, in this case, to try and reduce physical contact at, at, at key contact points like ports, um, which clearly uh, try and avoid delay. So there's been some element of traders, agents, and border force staff trying to exchange documents electronically, including by email, fax, or, or digital photograph. Um, but clearly, EU customs officials still required a hard copy of documents for transit purposes and, and proof of union status. Um, it is fair to say traders involved and authorised for export approvals uh, can apply to extend authorisations and, and that process becomes, um, uh, I wouldn't say a lighter touch, but uh, effectively there's a recognition in these difficult times uh, that the, um, the uh, applications can sometimes be by email uh, as well. Um, but 
uh, and also you'll see authorized consigners can apply to extend their authorization for additional locations. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had an institute masterclass on transit, for example, and we, um, and we, and we talked about this concept of authorized cons, uh, cons, consignees and authorized consignors. So at these difficult times, if companies are having to use different locations, uh, uh, for purpose of lockdown of certain facilities, you can apply for uh, for additional locations. But what this continues to show is those companies who are using custom special procedures that are known to customs um, and have these authorizations probably are in a good position because they are known. I, I, I don't like always using the word trusted, but they are known to customs and known to officials. So this shows the importance, as, as we've been saying at the Institute for a long time, the need to look at customs authorizations such as transit, warehousing, inward processing, outward processing. And we've had a, uh, a number of masterclasses and will continue to do so on those topics. It is fair to say UK Border Force are prioritizing checking of shipments of medical equipment and critical shipments can be flagged in, av in, in advance to Border Force. Um, and uh, clearly if you're supplying the likes of the NHS, uh, ensure you're working with them and equally working with Border Force to make sure your priority, your shipments are flagged. If we have the next slide, please. Now, this is quite a busy slide and, and literally about 30 minutes before this, uh, before this uh, webinar, a government notice came through. Uh, which has updated uh, this to some extent. But what you'll see here is you'll see on this not an exhaustive list of, uh, of, of commodity codes, quite a detailed list, which talks through descriptions where it's possible to pay no import duty and no import VAT. Now, the, the updated government notice indicates that there will be certain circumstances based on the commodity codes, and, 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 and there is a spreadsheet in, in a link, and we'll probably cover this in, in our daily bulletin tomorrow, uh, to members, uh, which will detail uh, circumstances in which no import duty and no import that will apply. So it's an update, but this is an important update. So if, you're, if goods are imported by or on behalf of an organization based in the UK, which is a state organization, or a, or, or a charitable or philanthropic organization, um, then it is possible that there'll be no import duty and no, uh, no import that applicable. There are certain circumstances applicable to that, which also relate around profit commercial sale, um, but it has to be to one of these organizations. If it's to another organization, uh, the importer must demonstrate that there has been a public need and a public good, um, and it's helping to combat the, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. So I just wanted to cover that point. There is further details and, and we will be providing uh, further information to our, uh, our, our members in our daily bulletin probably tomorrow. Uh, so do look out for that. But the point is, is that there are circumstances in which no import duty and no import that on certain equipment, which is defined by the commodity code. And there's some example commodity codes on this slide. But that, that, as I say, there has to be a, uh, a, uh, a government like National Health Service, clearly a charitable philanthropic organization where there is a public benefit from this import. If we have a next slide, please. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, the government made an announcement, and obviously this has passed now in terms of the 15th of April, uh, that companies could apply uh, the duty deferment uh, account holders uh, to defer making of their payment under customs duties and import VAT. Now, um, for those, uh, those of you that are um, uh, duty deferment holders that have import duty and import VAT to pay, uh, I hope you were, uh, uh, aware of this announcement, we obviously let all our members know uh, around the importance of, of applying if, if, if there were financial hardship issues around having to make that payment. Now, clearly for the next payment due, um, I would hope there'll be similar announcements, but we will obviously have to wait and see in that respect. So again, look out for that. And, and if you are going to be impacted by, by, uh, by having to make uh, uh, payments under duty deferment in May, do look, do look out for announcements and, and obviously try and recognize the impact on your business and cash flow of having to make those payments. If we have a next slide, please. So uh, force majeure, just a few things here. Uh, it's probably been touched on a bit. Um, all I'm really going to say here is, is obviously it depends on the underlying 
um, legal system you're you're selling under. So if it's common law system, English law, uh, force majeure is is not really uh, embedded within there. Now it obviously can be covered in in a contract, but it must be agreed by all parties. But if a sale or purchase is under, say, German law or French law, which is a civil law system, uh, then force majeure is, uh, is, is covered more. It is a key area. It's an area where obviously legal advice is required. Um, and, and I know in some instances it's, it's, it's been a, a, a sort of key topic area as well. The important thing, however, though, is to work with suppliers, customers and stakeholders so that we're all in this, all working together and, and not always trying to just refer to legal uh, positions uh, as we move forward. If we have the next slide, please. So uh, we have another poll, which I'll pass back to Will. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So the the next poll is going to go into how much cash does your business have in reserve? It's just trying to get a sense of um, how well set people are at the moment, because obviously it's quite a range of businesses out there in situations. So the question is, how much cash does your business have in reserve? And the options are 12 months and more, six to 12 months, three to six months, less than three months, or none. Uh, again, I'll leave that uh, for people to have a few seconds to answer. Uh, Kevin, another question we had in uh, in advance from someone called Lucy, who's uh, kind of touching on a point you were just raising. So she's asking, people talk about the importance of the correct commodity code, but could you explain the how important it is in the context of COVID-19? So just on the point of commodity codes, just how important are they? No, uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. So uh, there's a couple of aspects to this. Obviously, commodity codes are, are, are important at all times. Um, and if anyone's obviously not sure uh, about commodity codes, please take the, the Institute learning training in that respect. Um, at this time, commodity codes are important, partly, as I said, because some products are, uh, are very much defined as COVID-19 products, which are, which are linked um, in, in, in the government notices, which we're advising our members of. Uh, but also, uh, as, as well as that, it's very important that any requirement for licenses, regulations uh, are, are caught within the commodity code itself. So um, it's easy at this time to possibly try and take a shortcut if you're not sure of the commodity code, but try and avoid that. There was a government notice issued earlier this week about binding tariff information, BTI. So if you're not sure about the commodity code, even at this time, apply for a BTI. Uh, become very clear in in terms of the commodity code and what's actually required. Uh, I just can't stress how important it is at this time in terms of getting it right and obviously goods hopefully passing through. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And just going to share the results again. Uh, so we've got quite a range of different business situations out there uh, today. Um, only 9% with none, which is probably uh, a good thing, so that was more when we did the webinar last week. Um, and just while kind of digesting about that information, a few people saying they're struggling to click the buttons on the poll. Um, I think there's a um, interact, some people do just aren't able to interact with it as well as the majority of people. So I'm sorry about that, but um, a few people have been sending their answers through the question panel. So thank you, those people who have been letting me know there. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. Back to you, Kevin. Thank you. So we have a next slide, please. So um, this is a, a slide we looked at um, on the 26th of March, but I've just updated this clearly for exchange rates. But what we have clearly seen is the pound start to strengthen from, from lows, which really were around the 26th of March time. So the pound has strengthened clearly based on, on historical trends. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's weaker, uh, but it's strengthened. Uh, but just as I've said before, so I guess in the strength for importers, that's slightly better. For, for exporters, it's not as good, but still favorable if we compare it with the last few years. But again, same principles before, manage your exchange rate exposure. It's very, very difficult during these times when we're, we're and I do appreciate how everyone is busy. I've spoken to uh, a number of companies in the last few days who are who are more or less saying all they're doing is getting up in the morning and just working through and and then uh, uh, and then going to sleep at night. And it is really, really difficult. But the, the practices still around managing exchange rate exposure, for example, are still very, very important. We can see the oil price at historic lows. Um, 
uh, maybe that hasn't fed through to freight rates um, uh, as much as it could. Um, and that's obviously it has been political difficulties and, and, and discussions between certain countries, but also reflects the impact of supply as well and demand. So again, manage, look at these things for your business. It's so easy because we're all running around. We're very busy at the moment. It's so easy to, mix, uh, to miss things. If we have on the next slide, please. So we're coming through to some of the final slides now. Again, we had this last time, but there are a couple of important things I wanted to add on this. That same principles, same methods of payment, same need to, to credit check your customers. Don't forget the need for that, especially at the moment, clearly, where, where balance sheets, profit and loss accounts and cash flows will come under pressure. Uh, but work, again, with your suppliers, with your stakeholders. Had a few examples of, of clients being concerned about documentary less of credit. So try and make sure you work with the bank. Um, and if you have trading, for example, with countries like India, Pakistan, or and certainly India, which has been in lockdown, uh, obviously working with your bank, try and make sure that the documents get through. But there's various other countries as well, North Africa being uh, another example. So work with the bank on documentary credits. Uh, if necessary, try and get the documents through early, if at all possible, to, to try and meet timescales. That's another example of trying to prepare to have all the documents ready and in order. And I just wanted to mention towards the bottom of this slide, UK Export Finance made an important announcement around the extension of uh, uh, export credit insurance support. And I would stress this is support is available when it's not available from the private market, from your credit insurance company. Uh, and in some cases, obviously, in a lot of cases, you'll work for a, a credit insurance broker. But support has been now included following a, 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 an e EC commission announcement. Uh, whereby uh, member states can provide support for now for exports where it's not available from the private market insurance support to EU member states and high performing OECD markets like Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, Switzerland and United States, for example. So again, that is a potentially a very, very important announcement. If you are having difficulty getting that insurance cover or that insurance cover has been affected with support from UK Export Finance. If we have the next slide, please. Uh, trading services, again, this is one we talked about before, and it is fair to say that trading services has been impacted as well as trading goods. Clearly, some of the, uh, the classical trading services, services like tourism, uh, uh, leisure have been dramatically uh, impacted. So clearly, the impact on business depends on the types of businesses you are. We know there's a huge demand for 3D printers at the moment both in the UK and both the overseas. So I've been speaking to a number of UK companies who have been exporting uh, with, a, with a high demand for, for, for either 3D printers or the products that support 3D printers. Uh, but it, most of all, it's still important to note that the UK is heavily, highly regarded for both trading goods, manufacture, we're associated with quality and also trading services. We, we are a highly recognized country, uh, leading country with a leading university education network, which then feeds through to technology, life sciences, manufacturing companies. If we have the next slide, please. So importer and exporter considerations. Again, there's some element of having gone through this before in terms of communication, plan, have contingency, but also consider trade impacts from 2021. Um, as we indicated at the beginning of this webinar, uh, government announcements indicate that we are still due to leave the European Union uh, or that the end of a transition period, I should state, will still be on the 31st of December. Uh, so obviously there's there's considerations about that which continue um, and uh, obviously looking at supply chains going forward, where customers are based, the benefits of, of consolidated centers of production versus one place of production uh, and uh, diversification. So a lot for businesses to consider. So it is difficult when everyone's so busy to actually think about planning. Uh, but clearly, again, planning is very, very important in, in, in both these extraordinary times, but also with 2021 in mind. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, again, the Institute will keep you up to date with future trade and customs arrangements. We, we have our series of masterclasses. We have a couple of masterclasses next week on post-Brexit export planning and post-Brexit import planning. Uh, details are on our website of, of those masterclasses, which are very, very heavily attended. If we have a next slide, please. So we're coming towards the end. I just want to say something very quickly about Brexit announcements. Obviously, this webinar is not about Brexit. It's about COVID-19. But there are a number of announcements coming out on Brexit, which is very easy to miss at this moment in time. So there's some big announcements last week. Uh, that there, there was a, that there was an announcement a few months, months ago about postponed VAT. Uh, which we covered uh, in, uh, in, a, in a VAT masterclass we held yesterday. And there's also been announcements around guarantees for special procedures and customs authorization, like inward outward processing, temporary admission, uh, customs warehousing. So really important there around potentially uh, uh, no requirement for a guarantee um, uh, with 12 months notice of, of reintroducing guarantee procedures from January next year. So I'm not going to go into all those announcements. There are some important announcements there on this slide which affect companies that either have or are considering applying for special procedures, which are very, very important in terms of how we trade with Europe. But as we've seen, those companies that have those procedures during COVID-19 times, equally important. Equally, there's a, a big announcements on customs freight simplified procedures for intercompany trade and announcements around permanent business status uh, on branches in the EU around authorized economic operator. And again, we'll be covering those further during our post-Brexit masterclasses next week. If we have a next slide, please. So again, really, just as we're coming towards the end, training becomes more important than ever. Training, planning for the future. And we're seeing that a lot of the Institute uh, with companies obviously planning. The HMRC grant scheme is available. Please try and use it. We know lots and lots of companies are applying. So really, really need to try and use that scheme now and to maximize it for the benefit of your business whilst it's available. Uh, obviously, it will help in terms of Brexit and customs, which it's about, but it can have wider benefits for your business. So if we have the next slide, please. So again, final, literally the final slide for myself is please share your experiences with us. We're very keen to hear from you, your experiences. Thank you for, for coming back in, in the poll information today. Um, you are trading on the ground and it's very important that we hear your experiences. So thank you very much indeed. Great, thank you, Devin. Um, and just while, before we go to the question, I'm just gonna do one last poll. Uh, just asking, have you been able to successfully access any of the government's financial support packages? Um, just while people are answering that, thank you again to Kevin for the presentation there. Lots of uh, useful advice and information there, I hope. Uh, we will be shortly going to the Q&A part of the webinar. Uh, you are able to answer or ask questions even at any points using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. And we'll have a slide with a screenshot of where exactly that is uh, shortly. Um, but let's give people a bit more time to answer that question. Um, and while letting people do that, uh, Kevin, a question in advance. So one from James has asked uh, on the points you're just making, will customs easements be eligible for businesses regardless of their financial standing or is this means tested? Um, I think obviously it a lot depends on the use of the word easements. If it's around customs and customs procedures, it's probably more around the nature of the goods being imported or exported, the nature of the actual transport journey and the goods, perhaps slightly less around the company itself. Uh, whereas obviously some some customs authorizations and and, and guarantees requ uh, are required by customs uh, are, are, are if you like easier to achieve for, for companies that have been trading longer but in terms of easements it's probably more linked to the actual product itself and some of the points I, I made around the commodity code having a COVID-19 commodity code product uh, but also declaring your goods commodity code in the correct way and having beneficial use and sold to one of the organizations that were indicated. Great, thank you, Kevin. And I'm just going to quickly show the poll results. Uh, really interesting, actually. So um, 
a lot of people have been able to access the packages, 36%. Um, no, but I've tried is 12%, which I think is down on previous webinars. So that's encouraging. Um, obviously, for those people affected in that slot, um, mostly um, keep on trying you know, and uh, we can have support, hopefully, um, if you need any guidance, but obviously that's, that's one for the banks, not more. 20% um, have said not yet tried, 33%. Not needed to, but um, yes, a little bit of movement on those poll results. So if we move on to the next slide, please. And yeah, we'll, um, first question is actually from Rebecca, it's actually on one of the Brexit uh, slides. So she's asked, could you please expand on the postponed VAT points, please? Yeah, so it's something to say we covered um, uh, during our VAT masterclass. So from the uh, at the end of a transition period, the intention is is that for imports from uh, from uh, from EU and the rest of the world, will uh, VAT will be postponed. So import VAT where it is normally payable at the time of importation, it can be deferred to, uh, with a duty deferment account, but now it will be uh, effectively postponed doesn't mean it's um, which allows businesses to not um, to avoid uh, not having to pay the import VAT at the time of importation you can obviously claim it back through your through your VAT return in 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 some cases in uh, which is what you're doing today in terms of Europe so that benefits importers both uh, obviously in terms of business as usual for for what will become imports from the European Union but also has that benefit in terms of imports from the rest of the world Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, and another question just asking for clarification, I think, is from David, who's asked, what is a blank sailing? So uh, effectively, a blank sailing is a cancelled sailing. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Mary was, uh, will reagents for COVID-19 testing be subject to many trade restrictions? Uh, it's a good question. I think, um, I think there's different ways of looking at that. The, Clearly, there is a demand for re, uh, reagents, um, and, um, and and governments, I think, are going to want to closely monitor that. So, um, it, it, in terms of the restrictions at the moment, I think we'd need to check which uh, um, uh, uh, the extent to which reagents are covered in those restrictions. Uh, but um, uh, how can I put it? There is a demand for each country for those reagents. There is a shortage of supply. So the likelihood is that there will be some prioritization about the national need for those reagents. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we've had a few a few questions in about PPE. Uh, one, I'll, I'll do two in one. Um, so Janine asks, are face masks for general use, um, i.e. To, to avoid spreading the virus, classed as PPE? And then uh, Teen has asked, if we use or buy masks to use at work, do they need to comply with EU regulation um, 2016-46 and have CE marking? It's a good question. Certainly, I'll take the second one first. This question of CE marking has come up, and some large organisations I know have looked at this. Uh, and uh, in, in one instance, I think it was a, both a Japanese and a US pairing company said no, they were not going to uh, allow it for their European offices because it didn't hold a CE mark. So um, I think the CE mark becomes important, and it also, uh, and probably, uh, probably it's from a couple of weeks ago I'm talking here when the actual questions came up, and and. Uh, um, uh, where hopefully the, the the production cycles are increasing now, but um, I think it's really is down to company policy. But there have been instances, I think, where authorities uh, have wanted to know where the uh, where the PPE equipment is going uh, and who it's intended for, which comes back against to to the to the government notice. The priority is around the National Health Service, charitable organizations. Um, and certainly uh, another priority at the moment for Border Force is to make sure that, uh, that uh, a correct and compliant PPE enters the country, because unfortunately there have been examples of non-compliant PPE 
entering the country. Uh, I think it might also depend on the actual volume as well that's, uh, uh, that's actually being imported. So um, it's not a clear answer I'm going to give you. Uh, it's always best it does have the CE mark. Uh, however, I think that is paramount. Uh, there will be some uh, some around visors where, where, where I said the, the BSEN mark, but it has to, those have to be approved by a government committee. They won't just be allowed. So I would suggest if you're looking to do that or anyone looking to do that, you need to check with the government committee. We, we um, uh, I think there's a reference on one of the slides, but we can provide the reference to you if required. You would need to make an application. Always best to make an application. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we had, uh, we actually had a request from Tracy who's asked uh, to send details regarding the next Brexit workshops. Um, in terms of those workshops, you can find them um, on the exports.org site, um, and that should be under the training nav bar. But if you email us at admin at opentextbook.com, I can forward you the appropriate details. And then we had a question in from Tripti who's asked, what will the new system be post Brexit? And I think that relates, I assume, to customs. Kevin. Yeah, so oh, a couple of interesting points there. If um, probably a couple of new systems, the main system I presume it's been referred to is the customs declaration system. Um, well, that's one that it, one of them. So currently, for customs declaration, we have Chief, uh, the customs handling of import and export freight system, and there's been a lot of talk about a new system, CDS Customs Declaration Service. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about the systems running in parallel. Uh, so not taking down one system and uh, and putting in a new system. There have been some announcements in that respect, but further announcements will follow. Uh, I think there's a realization, obviously, that we can't just move, turn one system off and turn a new system on. So there has been a lot of talk of parallel running of those systems. I would stress, however, that the CDS Customs Declaration Service has new fields, new requirements, partly around safety and security, but other in terms of flexibility of the system and, and, and user experience. So uh, all businesses should be familiar with that, not just freight forwarders and agents if you're making direct declarations, but the traders. Because as before, it's the traders that are responsible for the customs declarations in the eyes of customs. Uh, and that goes for uh, uh, e-commerce small parcel operators as much as larger physical movement of goods. Now, in terms of other systems that could apply, I've talked um, about, more about systems, more around functions. I've talked about uh, uh, postponed VAT. I've talked about the um, uh, uh, the removal of the requirement, whether it's temporarily for customs author authorizations like warehousing, inward, outward processing. So those are perhaps more processes, but they are there to help UK businesses and very much there to help UK businesses uh, engage and work in supply chains. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And we'll do... I think two more questions, uh, starting with one from Sally, who's asked, uh, what is the turnaround time for uh, BTIs binding tariff information and how long do they last? OK, so first of all, I think they last three years, but um, but we'll check that point and just confirm. Turnaround time really varies um, uh, on a couple of things. Probably the biggest factor is how I don't like using the word straightforward. It is to actually determine what the uh, what the commodity code is for the product itself. So um, it, some products, for example, uh, automotive, medical products, engineering products, in theory, could be two or three different uh, commodity codes. So sometimes there'll be a need to send samples in, whether that's samples by the post. Clearly, the ability at the moment to go and visit a company to actually look at, uh, at, at the product and the sample becomes uh, more difficult. So it partly depends how 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 difficult non-standard your product is, how new your product is, um, and the extent to which you need to send samples in for approval, whether it's photographs or formal physical samples, uh, as to how long it would take. Clearly, it can take longer, the more complex and the more that needs to be reviewed, or it could be quicker uh, if, um, if information is, uh, is, is, is more readily and available to hand. Great, thank you, Kevin. And one last question, which does retract something you've already mentioned, but um, I think it's worth bringing up anyway. It's from Richard, and he's asking in terms of items of PPE, um, which some of them, which 
typically incur import duty. He's asked whether save costs and speed up the processes um, for this duty to be waived, but I guess I mean, some of it already has been waived, hasn't it? Yeah, again, I think, uh, again, so apologies if I've understood the, uh, the question correctly. Um, if it's if it's linked to a COVID-19 commodity code, and there's information, I think, on our links which indicate what, what are COVID-19 commodity codes, and just a bit of background to those codes. Those codes were initially established by the World Customs Organization, the WCO, who created a global list of COVID-19 commodity codes. Uh, obviously, uh, again, sorry, for those of you that are aware without talking jargon, based on the harmonized system HS codes, the European Union went further and added codes, uh, and then the UK has gone even further and added some codes as well, as have other national uh, customs authorities in the European Union as well. So um, it's important that the product is on that COVID-19 commodity code, but equally in terms of duty and VAT, there has to be that public need to a government, a health service, charitable uh, philanthropic organization uh, and and it, but if you are something to uh, selling someone else where there is a public need uh, then obviously you can make an application for it to, to not incur import duty and import fat great but um i think it's probably time for us to wrap up thank you thank you kevin once again for the for the answers there and for the presentation um, so yeah, thank you, Kevin. And yeah, just a quick reminder to everyone that you can download the slides via the handout drop down in the control panel. If we can move on to the next slide, please. We've got a couple of weeks of webinars on the Open to Export platform, with our next session looking at reaching customers online over on May 21st. Uh, you can find sign up details to that at opentoexport.com forward slash webinars. Next, please. And the Institute, of course, continues to support businesses through these trying times uh, through our range of online training and support, including online training courses and the masterclass webinars, which Kevin's been describing. There's the international trade surgeries, which can be done over the phone, online qualifications with the IOE and also on the sister UK Customs Academy. There's the technical helpline for any questions you may have. Our daily bulletins bring you all the key stories in trade and of course the free articles and webinars on open to export you can find out more information about our support on export.org.uk and don't forget that many of our training courses can still be funded by government grants next please and through these historic times it's really important that we support each other and share information and wisdom around best practice in global trade and the challenges ahead Membership with the Institute gives you a support network and a wealth of information to ensure that you have everything you need to meet the challenges of global trade. And as mentioned earlier, um, benefits include things like the technical helpline, um, industry recognition of your exporting credentials and a wealth of online information, trade updates, and hopefully in the future, again, uh, events and networking opportunities too. To find out more about membership with the Institute, please do look at the site export.org.uk forward slash membership. And our membership services team are always on hand to answer any questions or queries you may have. But that is all from us today. We hope you found today's webinar useful. Please do take our survey to let us know what you thought. And until next time, stay safe and goodbye.